to get direct flights in and out of Magadan. Well. Um, so initially my job was to travel all through the year and meet the Russians in the mines and uh, as I said, gain rapport with them to see if we could do business with them. How, how was it, um, how was it different? Cause I'm assuming it was really different from being a salesperson to someone in America. How was it different being a salesperson to a well, Russian right I, after the fall? Of the I wasn't really a salesperson. Um, uh, I, I was, I wasn't trying to sell them anything. I was just trying to, um, gain their support and their confidence yeah. to do business with us. How did you do that? Well, just by meeting them. And, and the tool that we used was that we would, I would provide a service for them and check their machines on a periodic basis mm -hmm. These of these 95 bulldozers. Uh, this is a group, this is what, if you look at some old pictures of the United States in in um, in the 30s, that's what people <laughs> look like. This was in 1992, 93. So I would measure their, 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 their the undercarriage wear on their machines. Yeah. And I had an uh, ultrasonic tester and all that to do that. And I would, I would give them a printout. I had a little compact computer and a printer. And I would print out the projected life of the undercarriage, which is the main wear factor uh -huh. in a bulldozer. And that was the service that I provided for them to, to help gain rapport with them. And okay. it didn't cost them anything. Yeah. Um, Just I've got different pictures. I mean, these are just different meetings, uh, different people that I met in different parts. This was in a place called Susamon, which is up in this area. Okay. Um, this is also in a place called Susamon. That's the same guy there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's like 40 below outside. Oh, I believe it. That <laughs> but, sounds horrible. But What was that like? The amount of vodka you drink keeps you warm. What was 40 below? It was cold. Yeah. <laughs> Coldest I was ever in was 70, 73 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Oof. This is a little a typical village up in the, in the... Uh, wow. Siberian areas. Yeah. This is actually in Magadan here. This is in Magadan. Typical old concrete buildings. Yeah. Now you see this picture here. This is an apartment building, <clears throat> and they have this is their freezer. Everything hangs out the window. Oh wow! They have a bracket, and they have a box out there. And some of them, um, like here, there's a there's an opening here, and then you have a little thing on the inside. Okay. That is. Um, sort of insulated, and uh, that's where you keep your stuff to keep it cold. Wow. This is looking out of my apartment window. It's the view I had. Really looked very inviting. <laughs> <laughs> I had another picture here of my apartment.
Um, so initially when I went over there, I was in a place in the, the, the gold mining company was Severovostok Zoloto. Um, that translated means Northeast gold. Yeah. Gold is Zoloto in Russian. Okay. And um, they had a, a building that was from the ground up, it was five floors. It was built like a Pentagon. Okay. And I was the only American in that place. Wow. Nobody, hardly anybody spoke English. Yeah. So I had to learn to speak Russian or to at least understand it anyhow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there were a few people that could speak a little a little English, but yeah. not many. Yeah. <clears throat> and when I first went over, I didn't have an office. I would just camp out in, in somebody's office for a while. Mm -hmm. And then um, eventually uh, I had an office that I was given and um, I would lock it up and I'd go back home for, for three weeks and I'd come back over for three weeks. But I'd, I'd only be there, you know, for a day or two, not to be out traveling around up in here. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Eventually, the, uh, in 1994, we got here to my apartment. That's what my apartment building looked like. I was up that was my window right there. Oh, no, over here. That was your window? That was my window there. Yeah. But you can see how ratty the place is. I mean, it just, there was no pride in socialism, there was just, I mean, nobody cares about anything. Yeah. It's all owned by the government and the people don't take care of things. They don't really care. And um, inside their apartments were a different story. Yeah. That was their space. Yeah. But outside, they didn't care. Yeah. Didn't take care of things. Didn't care if things fell apart or not. Yeah. It was sad. I mean, it, um, the first time I flew, the very first time I flew in, we flew into Khabarovsk, and when we had our meeting um, later on up in Magadan, we flew into Khabarovsk, and there was a big line of airline uh, airplanes, uh -huh. like 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 uh, seven twenty seven jets, uh -huh. um, and they had no engines in them. They were all cannibalized. They took the engines out and used them in other planes. And they were just sitting there. Just, I mean, that's socialism. Yeah. And communism is even, you know, communist socialism is even worse. But, um, and I thought to myself, because all of our lives, and I know you don't understand or don't remember this, but when I was growing up, it was the Cold War. Yeah. And um, Khrushchev and all the threats against America. And, you know, we have to watch, we got to be careful with, you know, with these people. And that's the only thing that I knew. I never, you know, I knew no, no, nothing about it when I went to work over there. So I didn't quite know what to expect. Yeah. And I, as we landed the plane and we were taxiing, I looked at those shells of airplanes mm -hmm. and I thought, we were afraid of this? Yeah. They don't even, I mean, <laughs> they, couldn't, they, they couldn't get any of those planes up in the air if they wanted to. Yeah. Now, the military may be a different story. Yeah. You know, but uh, I mean, it was, just, it was just poor. And I grew up, I was a kid, a young kid. I was born in 1940. So I was, I grew up in the forties, my, you know, until I was 10 years old, obviously. Um, and when I went over there, it was like revisiting the time when I was growing up in the forties. Wow. That's how far behind 
they were. Yeah. So and weird. It was, I mean, it was really eye opening. And fast forward a little bit to 1993, um, we finally got everything negotiated out, uh, everything was set, and we started a warehouse over there for our, we got to begin our, our dealership. <clears throat> and at that point, um, I had to go over and get the warehouse set up, and and um, we had nine containers of parts and supplies in the uh, this is a typical hotel room. Uh, That is a statue of Lenin, and then this is a building that they started and never finished. Wow. It was like, they call it the tallest building in the world. But it, I mean, it was just, it was a joke in Magadan because it was, it had never gotten finished. Never, I don't even know if it's finished yet today. Really? Yeah. Um, and that was big, there was a big square here. And then the, uh, Lenin, who was the father of the, uh, Russian Soviet Union in the beginning. He's the one that started the communism there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's statues of him all over the place. Yeah, a lot of them are taken down now. But uh, what was I, I was starting to say something else about when we went over there in 1993, late 93, to set up our warehouse. Um, I was going to have to be there for three months straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, my boss said, would your wife like to go? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked her and she said, oh, I'd love to. And we were, we had our two daughters, Beth and Christy. Mm -hmm. Beth was 13. Christy was nine. Mm -hmm. So they went over and we all stayed in, uh, in this apartment here. Um, there was... like a bedroom, a living room, and a meeting room. Mm -hmm. Big meeting room, a big table. Um, but they got to see Russia firsthand. Yeah. And they really appreciated where they came from. Yeah. After they were there. I bet. Because, again, the, the, the country had failed. Yeah. And you would, you, Judy would go to go shopping. Mm -hmm. I brought food in a, in containers. Mm -hmm. I brought up a bunch of food in a container, but it was all canned goods. It was all, you know, spam. We ate spam all yeah, the time. I've heard a lot about spam. From um, <clears throat> but if she wanted to cook potatoes or carrots or cabbage or something, she had to go buy it. And our friend, my, my, uh, my, uh, translator's wife's name was Galena. Yeah. And she would take Judy all around town. And uh, she became our adopted daughter, Russian daughter. Um, but, I mean, they would go into a, into a store and there'd be three potatoes and that's it. Wow. And, you know, people outside, maybe some little old lady sitting there selling a, a one potato that she had. Uh -huh. Because they had no money. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was extremely sad. And I'm, I hate to say it, but I mean, I, it's exactly what's happening in Venezuela right now. Mm. They went broke. Socialism didn't work. And those people are suffering. Yeah. Um, and they didn't have, uh, Russia was able to rebound a bit, but, um, a lot of people suffered really bad over that thing. So anyhow, fast forward, we opened the warehouse, and I do have a picture of that someplace in here. Um, we called it NC International, and um, we had our parts containers. 
we had a customs, we ran what was called a customs bonded warehouse, which meant that it was like a little island of America in the middle of Russia. Yeah. So what that meant, a customs bonded warehouse meant that we could bring our parts in uh -huh. and they would be stored in our warehouse uh -huh. and we wouldn't have to pay tax or duty on them. Okay. Because if we wanted to, if we if we did have to pay tax or duty, we would never get that back from the government yeah. if we wanted to return those parts to America. Yeah. So. Um, that makes sense. So we had this little island, customs bonded warehouse, and we had, because they, this was a closed city, they had never had anything like this. Yeah. Um, we had license 001. Okay. First, very first license ever issued for a customs bonded warehouse. Wow. And it was a learning process for the customs people because they'd never dealt with anything like this yeah. before. So everything was like pulling teeth. I bet. Because they were afraid of being, of doing something wrong uh -huh. because the punishment for doing bad things over there is pretty severe. So they made sure that every I was dotted, every T was crossed, yeah. and, and um, it was it was a very arduous task. I, they had 30 days to approve my application, and they took 31 Wow! before I got. And I was told by different people, you need to pay them off. You need to pay them off, and then you'll get your license. Yeah. And I said, we don't do business like that. Yeah. If we have to pay anybody off, we won't be here. We'll leave. Yeah. So I stuck it out, and they were waiting it out for me to pay them off, and they never really? did. Really? So, um, yeah, <laughs> we finally got our license. Now, when you have a customs bonded warehouse, that means that everything that you sell to somebody has to be cleared through customs because it's now on a, it's still in a little island of America. Yeah. So we had to make a customs declaration out for everything that we sold. Wow. Everything, you know, we, some we could list. You know, somebody wanted to buy five or ten parts. We could list those things on one declaration, uh -huh. and then the customs inspector would have to come to the warehouse and witness us taking that through the gate and signing off on it. I mean, it was just a nightmare. Yeah, the way we had to do business. And how long did you have to do business like that for? The entire time? No, until I left, we were still doing it that way. Wow. Because we would not, the customs, the VAT, mm -hmm. value-added tax, which is like a sales tax, yeah. was 23%. Sales tax was 21%. Oh, my God. I mean, customs duty was 21%. Yeah. And that was, that was an average based upon what the product was. If it was an engine, it might be 15%. Uh -huh. If it was a bolt... It could be 21%. Um, and it, I mean, a, a, everything that you had at a different rate. So right off the bat, there was like 45, 46% yeah. that had to be added to the parts price. That's crazy. For the end user. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then the time delay in getting it through customs because even though we had this part here, sometime it took three days to get them to go. We had to go down and stand in line at the at the seaport, at the customs house, and we had to go through five different departments mm -hmm. to get five different sign-offs. Sometime they'd be out to lunch, and we'd have to sit there until they came back from lunch. Oh my gosh! It was. I mean, it was just so backward, yeah. antiquated. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but it was a challenge, and it was, you know, I, you know, I enjoyed it. But people that worked that I worked with mm -hmm. thought I was crazy. Why? But, well, I mean, they, they just said, "How can you put up with that?" Yeah. You know, I mean, it was just. But you, you know, you you get to learn to like these people. Um, Clearing customs every time we flew in to Magadan. Uh, once they got the airport open, uh, the international flights. Every time you flew in, you had to clear customs. Mm -hmm. 
I have a picture here someplace of me getting out of a small plane coming from going to one of the mine sites. And um, you carry your own bags. There's okay. no baggage service. Yeah, yeah. They, they'll x-ray it and they customs will clear it. Uh -huh. And then you pick it up and then you carry it out to the plane. And you put it on the plane. Yeah. And when you get to where you're going, you take it off the plane. They don't, there's no baggage Weird. service. Yeah. So the first thing you do when you go into a car, foreign country, you have to clear the the immigration, the border the border patrol or mm -hmm. the border guards. So you go through that, they stamp your passport and let you in, and then you have to fill out a customs declaration. Yeah. And the customs declaration, you have to list everything that you have that you want to take back with you. And you have to show them how much money you have. Because everything that you buy over there, you have to get a receipt for it. And then you have to have the difference in money, the change from what you brought over and what you spent in your hand wow. when you leave. Yeah. So I used to carry three to five thousand bucks with me every time I went over. Yeah. Because I'd be over there and I had to pay for my own hotel rooms, I had mm -hmm. to buy my own food, I did all that sort of thing. And um, you never knew what, you know. I ran out of money once and I was way, way down in Petropavlovsk down oh, here. No. And I had three days before the airplane flew. Oh my gosh. And I so I, it was a hundred bucks a night for a hotel room. And this is what the, the neat part of this whole adventure. Um, there was a, a small group of people by that time, this was in the mid 90s now, um, a small group of people <coughs> that flew back and forth all the time. Yeah. So you got to know one another yeah. and people that did business over there. And uh, the, all Alaska Seafoods had a crab processing ship yeah. in the seaport of Petropavlovsk. So uh, Petropavlovsk was called PK, initials of PK. And one of the guys was on there. He was the, he was the guy that was in charge of that sea, food, seafood processing mm -hmm. boat. It was a crab processor. Yeah. Um, so he said, yeah, if you ever get down PK, like stop in and see me. I'll give you, a, you know, get a real good meal on the boat, you know. Yeah. So I called him up. I had his card and I had his phone number. And that's another thing. The telephone service over there was unbelievable, terrible. Yeah, I bet. Um, I called him up and I said, hey, I can't remember even his name at this point. I said, I, um, I'm stuck. They just kicked me out of the hotel. I don't have any money. I've got a few rubles and that's it. And I said, the plane doesn't fly for three days. Mm -hmm. So he says, come on down. So I got a taxi and I went down to the, to the thing. To the, and the processing boat was sitting at the, at the dock. It wasn't working. You know, they were waiting for the crab season to open up. Yeah. <clears throat> so he said, there's only eight people on board. So, you know, here's the kitchen. You know, here's the food. Go cook whatever you want, yeah. eat whatever you want. And when you gotta go to the airport, let me know and I'll get I'll get somebody to take you to the airport. So, wow. <laughs> that's crazy. But that's I mean, that's the you know, that's what happens. You you meet these people and one you know, people take care of each other. But that was an experience. I spent three days on a crab processor. Yeah. <laughs> one time I brought some parts over for him. Really? Um, this was probably before we got the warehouse opened up. And they had cat engines in their in their boat, their ship. So they needed parts for their engine or stuff like that and thing would, you know, relays and stuff like that. So I managed to get the custom uh, get it through customs without getting caught. Mm -hmm. Had it in my my suitcase, my bag. And I brought it, you know, I brought it, I finally was able to contact him. And he said, "Okay, um over on the, down the, 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 this is a seaport, Magadan was a seaport. Okay. He says, when you, on the, on the east, or east side of the airport, there's a, a dock. He says, I'll send a boat in for it. And he says, I'll have a present for you. So, 
and I, I mean, there was already, we were billing them for the part. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were billing them through Alaska, mm -hmm. through American, um, the American business. And um, the guys come in in the boat and they're just, you know, just a, like a, oversized rowboat. I mean, it was a huge boat, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything fancy. Yeah. And uh, it was open, you know, open like a, like a lifeguard boat, like, a, you know, something like that. Okay. And uh, the guy gets out. He says, oh, you got the parts for me? I said, yep. And I handed him the stuff. He says, here, I got a box for you. Hand me a box, 20 pounds of king crab. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Frozen. Because oh, he was out, you know, they were processing at that yeah. time. So he brought me a box of frozen crab legs. <laughs> that was probably worth 150 bucks. <laughs> Jeez. But um, anyhow, uh, we went, we did business with the Russians. Um, we probably did $20 million a year wow. in parts business to them. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a tough business. I had eight or nine Russian employees at that point. And um, I paid them the dollar equivalent to what, you know, not what they would earn in Alaska, but I mean, it was a fair wage for Russia. It was a very fair wage for Russia. It was a high rate, high wage for Russia. Mm. And, um, and of course I had to pay them in rubles. Yeah. And, um, they uh, they did very well. Yeah. Uh, there's this, this is one of the guys that worked for me. His name was Sergey. This is a, this is him. We went out and got crab crab legs one time <laughs> out in the uh, at the seaport. This was our big meeting room. This is where Beth and Christy lived. They slept in there. Mm when they were there. How long did it take you to learn Russian? Speak it well, confidently. I never did really speak confidently because there was always a word missing okay. and it's something I wanted to say that I yeah. didn't know. But I, the thing that was nice about it is what I did speak, I didn't have an accent because I learned from Russian speakers yeah and uh, it was I mean I could pass for Russian when I went traveled down to Habarsk and everything I would I made it a point to not look American yeah because you there was problems I mean there it was it was like the wild wild west okay. in those days there was no law it was very lawless the mafia was in strong power the mm -hmm. Russian mafia yeah and um that's another story I can tell you, uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was, I was able to travel those key words that I knew and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, it was, it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I was telling this tell you before, there used to be a cartoon on TV and it's still, I've seen it still on TV where there's a dog that chases, a, I don't know, it's a coyote or something. And they walk to work together in the morning. Mm -hmm. And there's a time clock hanging on a tree. Mm -hmm. And the coyote punches in and the dog punches in and then the dog starts to chase the coyote. Are you talking about Roadrunner? No. No. It's not Roadrunner, it's, uh, the dog's name was Precious. I can't remember what the cartoon okay. <laughs> <clears throat> But, and then at the end of the day, you'd see him walk up to the tree, punch in, uh -huh. or punch out, yeah. each of them, yeah. and then they put their arm around each other and uh -huh. away they go. <laughs> that was the relationship that I had with customs. Oh, I bet. Up at the airport. Um... They would give me a hard time about stuff, you know, oh, you can't bring that in. Yeah. And I'd say, yes, I can. And then, no, you can't bring that in. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, he'd go through my stuff and, you know, sometimes they would and sometimes they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. 
the, the border guards, very stern, you know. And then when I would leave mm -hmm. the country, yeah. I, was, I was leaving to go back to America, mm -hmm. um, the customs guy would say, Sam, can you develop my film? <laughs> I said, sure. So he would give me three or four little rolls of film, uh -huh. and I'd put them in my bag, and I'd go, and I'd go to Costco and get them delivered, and yeah. get them two prints of everything. <laughs> and I'd come back, you know, three weeks later, and um, he'd be on duty, and just giving me a hard time again, you know, he says, after I'm all done and everything. Uh -huh. And I'd say, he says, you have $3,000? I said, yes. He says, let me see your money. So I'd have to get my money out and count it out and show him the money. Wow. And say, he says, you have my film? <laughs> he says, I meet you outside. <laughs> oh, my so, gosh. And, I mean, I went, I went up there in 1994. I went through customs. That's when Papa Deacon died, 1994, the year you were born. Yeah. And um, he had heart medicine that was unused. Yeah. So Nana Deacon said to Judy, she said, why don't you see if Sam can use, take this over to Russia for the Russians? Yeah. You know, maybe they can. So she sends a box of this stuff. It's got syringes little vials of medication and stuff like that. <laughs> and I put it in my box. I used to carry a couple of bags. I had an insulated bag with a, I would freeze a gallon of orange juice in the middle of this insulated bag. And that was my refrigerator to get over there with, I'd take hamburger meat over and, you know, fresh stuff. Yeah. So I had this, um, this small box of drug paraphernalia and <laughs> drugs <laughs> in the uh, and I had a doctor's name mm -hmm. that I had gotten from a lady who was uh, worked at the University of Anchorage University of Alaska mm -hmm. I met her on a flight once uh, later on they came over to do some knee replacements mm -hmm. and customs held all the knees all of the replacement knees in customs for the entire week that they were there to do the operations these people volunteered to come over and do operations. Yeah. And the customs wouldn't release the parts. Jeez. So they had to get on a plane and go back, and they never did any oh, operations. Gosh. So, but anyhow, she gave me this name of the doctor in Magadan. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm going through the customs, and I have this box, and it was a girl. Mm -hmm. The customs agent was a girl. Yeah. And um, she says, what do you have in this box? I said, just my clothes and you know she says open that box uh, so I uh -oh. I take the rope off the box I open the box up she says what's it a small box so I open that up well, I says it's medicine that I'm taking to the hospital mm -hmm. and uh, she opens I open it up and she looks at it she says <laughs> this is contraband contraband you oh cannot gosh. take this in I said I'm not leaving it here I said this has to go to this is heart medicine Mm -hmm. for doctor whatever his name was mm -hmm. and I'm taking it to his hospital tonight yeah and she said you can't take this through you cannot this is contraband you can't take this I said I'm not gonna say no yeah I'm not I'm not giving it up and I'm not you know I said you can arrest me if you want but I'm not, I've got to take this to this doctor yeah so she finally said okay <laughs> and I said you want to go with me? I'll wait outside and and um, you can go with me to the hospital and you'll see that I'm going to give this to this doctor. Yeah. I mean, it's like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And um, so she did. She went with me. Wow. And I said, hey. and I took it in and gave it. To, I didn't, I didn't, the doctor wasn't there. But I left it at the hospital for this doctor. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, it was that kind of a thing. It was mm -hmm. one time, <laughs> Russians are terrible with Russians. One time, the U.S. had come out with a new $100 bill. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Different look, different than the old ones. Yeah, quite a bit different. So, <laughs> enterprising crooked Russians were going to other Russian people that had some hard currency, had some hundred dollar bills, mm -hmm. and they say, "Ah, America has changed no hundred dollar bills." Those are no good anymore. You have to have this kind of hundred dollar bill. Mm -hmm. So, you give me the old one, I give you fifty dollars. Oh no! So, oh my they, gosh! They were chipping each other, you know. Seriously. So this one customer, customs agent, his name was Victor, and um, he was. I he, I used to get film for him all the time. He says. Uh, you have, he, he says, show me your money. I showed him my money. He says, you have new $100 bills. Mm -hmm. He says, can you change me $100 bills? I said, sure. Because, I mean, I, I knew I wasn't going to spend everything, and he only had like $300 bills. Yeah. So <clears throat> he says, not here, not here. So I said, <laughs> he says, can you wait for me? I said, yeah. So on the plane was a bunch of guys from a company called Cypress Minerals. They were out of Denver and they had a joint venture mine up in here. So they had they were joint ventured with a Russian company. And these guys were in and out of Magadan all the time. And in fact we had a spaghetti dinner and Judy uh, mom made the made the uh, dinner for them out of our all of our stock with the containers and spam nice. <laughs> spam meatballs. <laughs> so anyhow, these guys are on the same plane. So they were sitting in their van. There's like four or five of them. And they were, you know, they came through customs at different times. So there's two or three of them still in the van, and the other guys are still coming through customs. So I had come through customs, and I'm sitting on the back of my tailgate in my pickup truck. A guy came out and picked me, and came out and comes out and picks me up. Uh, one of my employees. So I'm sitting there waiting for Victor to come out. So Victor comes out. And I'm sitting on the tailgate, and Victor pulls out money out of his pocket, and I get my money out. So I'm changing the money, for, you know, thinking nothing. Oh, no big deal. So these guys from Cypress Minerals, uh -huh. they said, you're paying off customs. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you can get stuff through. I said, no, 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 no. I said, that these guys are... Chipping each other, cheating each other, yeah. and you know, trying to steal each other's hundred dollar bills. Oh my gosh. So I mean it was just that was the way it was. I had another customs agent.